Edmund Burke's fame quote about history and remembrance, those who don't remember history are destined to repeat it, has been uttered so often it has become cliché. Yet this precaution is only selectively applied. We have certainly tried hard to remember some history, but whose history is this? And more importantly, whose history are we not remembering? Ours is an education built on the tomes of a Euro-Christian tradition, and our learning deposits in increasing depth the long and arduous history of Western Europe, focusing nonchalantly on its imperialist legacy at the price and erasure of non-dominant narratives. History is told by the winners, another banality states. Nowhere is this more evident than in the history textbooks of American schools, where the white man's history reigns supreme. We must ask ourselves, what is American history? More importantly, who is American? Public discourse would have us believe that ours is a country of multiraciality and immigration, but if that's the case, where are those Americans' places in the history of our nation? Where are the stories of people of color, queer communities, immigrants, and others who diverge from what Audre Lorde calls the mythical norm of the white, middle-class heteropatriarchy? There is no public service greater than access to information. Today, it is more important than ever that we induct a more comprehensive study of the histories of American people of color, their origins in this country, their political developments, the institutional oppressions that they have faced and continue to face. Asian American studies is one key example of a history that has fallen victim to the selective memory of our hegemonic culture. The history of Asian Pacific Islander struggles are almost never taught in the American classroom. The pivotal work of activists at San Francisco State University, the Iwar Quen, and the Asian American Student Alliance, amongst others, are absent in most American narratives. The history of the Asian American political consciousness has been all but forgotten. But we can't forget this history, nor those of other marginalized non-white peoples. In the face of existing racism, more importantly, its intersectional offshoots of sexism, homophobia, transphobia, we can't afford to forget the struggles of those who came before us and the context in which we now make our meaning. Though the struggle for an Asian American Studies department here at Williams College traces back some 25 years, its presence in the course catalog is minimal at best. With the recent departures of professors Vincent Schleitweiler and Ji Young Um, Asian American Studies scholars at the college number at a meager three. The impending departures of professors Vivian Huang and Scott Wong next semester will leave that number at just one, Professor Dorothy Wong of American Studies. This will mean that unless other faculty are hired, there may not be a single Asian American Studies course next semester. The Record Editorial Board wrote in 2012 that it was concerned that the scope of Asian American studies might be too narrow to merit an entire concentration. This is an assumption as unfortunate as it is misdirected and simply fallacious. Like any other multidisciplinary subject, economics, art history, computer science, comparative literature, to name just a few, all of which exist as established programs at the college, the nature of Asian American studies is rich and varied. A small sampling of topics in the field includes Asian American history, visual arts, sexuality and gender studies, psychology, and performance studies, each with its own distinct epistemology and pedagogy. Paired with the sheer scope of the Asian diaspora, Asian American studies is hardly a field to scoff at. Reflecting on the student strikers at San Francisco State University, scholar Daryl Maida writes that education is a means of self-determination. As an Asian American student here at the college and a board member of the Williams Asian American Students in Action, I have a vested interest in the creation of an Asian American Studies Department, or at least an increase in the resources dedicated to it. But this is an issue much bigger than me or any Asian American student. At its core, Asian American Studies offers a multidisciplinary lens through which to examine the history of a crucial group of Americans, and it is a class for all students, Asian Americans and otherwise. And it is a subject field that we need and deserve. 
because tokenization is the curse of the minoritarian subject. Because the question remains, gracious, why is this Asian girl so defensive? Doesn't she know we're not racists, not imperialists, we're on her side? And the thought remains, oh, she's so passionate. It's so good to see young people so fired up about issues they care about, but this does feel so awfully like an attack, and that's unfair. I've never done anything to her or against her. But the very problem with these thoughts, these innocent wisps of conscious recoil, is that they betray the stark binary through which I can appear to you. Maybe when you first saw me, before I began to speak, you thought me sweet looking, cute even, with my boyish haircut and gangly limbs. Most people do, and most people say so after hearing me speak the way I usually do. And why, sh why shouldn't they? My daily speech is coursing with vocal fries, lilting pleasingly upwards in uncertainty, dotted with demure pleases, and thank you, sir, ma'am, friend. But it's doubtful that just now, after that, passionate, by which you mean defensive, angry, and intimidating speech anyone in this room thought me cute. Or maybe someone did, but respectability politics would guarantee that none would ever admit such a thing. It would make them a racist, and oh, goodness gracious, haven't we established we are not like those people? Or maybe, and this is just a possibility, my rage turned you on. I don't mean turn you on in a purely sexual kind of way, though that certainly is a possibility. Maybe you thought you were impressed with me. Wow, what a passionate young woman. She's so fierce, so outspoken, and just breathing fire. But I want to push you further and ask about the relief that belies the superficial applause. If really, what you felt, not what you thought, was how nice it is to see an Asian woman diverge from her usual submissiveness. And especially if you're a heterosexual woman, what a relief it is to see that she is so different from those other docile, man-stealing Orientals. My femininity is not threatened by her. This brash, scary, mildly masculine-appearing person who no man will want. And you're probably right. Because if you are a man who is sexually attracted to women, my rage, and I know this from experience, probably terrifies you. But maybe, maybe, there is also a heady eroticism tinging your scornful gaze. I like a woman who is wild, who is free, open, and independent, you may tell yourself. But my body appears to you under this circumstance not as one which is free or open or independent. Rather, it is a spectacle, an object of intrigue. For the real sentiment undergirding the seemingly innocent desire is intimately and inextricably tied to your subconscious reckoning of my exotic otherness. Is it true that the Asian vagina is sideways? The crack used to run. The bitter irony is that though this joke has been erased by political correctness, the sentiment, the strange allure of an Asian female body remains undeniably alive, linked to ugly subconscious memories of the obedient, hardworking Asian with their stout, short men and willowy, ephemeral women. If not ready to be your submissive lover, she is ready to give you a good time anyway, with her streaming black hair and red lips made all the more striking by the vitriol spilling out of them. But either way, she is yours. Your cute, sexy, demure, demanding China doll. I guess at this point, it's too, tell it's too late to tell you that um, I'm queer. That desire is fucked, and that overrepresentation is the burden of the minoritarian subject. It doesn't matter that I'm a vibrant, intelligent, outspoken, three-dimensional person with a set of complex feelings that will never be knowable to you. It doesn't matter, because language is dangerously unstable, and what matters isn't how I am, but how you read me, how you read all of us. 
East Asian, South Asian, South Seas Asian, Central Asian. The differences are really too subtle to require you to be able to tell the difference. But therein is the problem. Regardless of the drastically differing cultures, languages, and histories of our heritage as Asian Americans, regardless of the monumentally differing characteristics that define us as people, we will always be trapped within the narrow sets of predetermined expectations which govern the ways we are read, the ways we are anthologized by voices that are not ours in every part of our lives, including and especially in the official texts of academia that narrate or erase our tales into oblivion or monolithic unidimensionality. We will always be forced to be reduced in one way or another to stock characters delimited by one-dimensional characters so flat, 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 like our dark, slanted eyes. There is no easy, digestible moral to this story, only doubt. Doubt that my humanity can ever be reclaimed, my voice ever truly heard in this sphere and all others, including and especially those of the academy. Williams College sold me a dream of academic rigor, told me a tale about a unique model of education distinguished by its firm dedication to progressivism and intellectual exploration. I was drawn to this promise of excellence, this glittery guarantee of legacy, honor, and respect. But the reality that I have seen, indeed the reality that I have lived, is one in which the same old shit plays out. Maybe this is why we need Asian American studies. It's a small attempt to return agency dare I utter it, to those whose voices have been taken away from them, an ounce lifted off the burden of erasure. Because regardless of how well-meaning you may be, there is not a single doubt in my mind that when and if, because the non-threatening nature of us Asian women make us prone to be forgotten, you remember this speech, you will think something about that Asian girl. Doubtful it is that Asian American will ever cross your mind unless you are Asian American. Maybe this is why we need Asian American studies. It's a space for Asian Americans to learn about our historic selves, a space in which we can reclaim our present selves in all their contradiction, glory, nuance. Because I am one speck amongst 14% here at the college, but I am so much more than a number. Because it is exhausting to have to bear the burden of an entire people's on my back every time I open my mouth. Because individuality and self-ownership are luxuries afforded only by whiteness. And so I ask, nicely, urgently, passionately, forgivingly, for a crevice within the academic Goliath to call my own. But unlike David, I am not afforded a rock with which to claim my peace. I have only my voice, and even that is turned against me, made not wholly mine. And so I tell. This is not a story about one Asian, all Asians, no Asian. This is not a story with a piecemeal moral or a happy ending. This is not even my story, but a story with a life of its own, it is a Goliath which has consumed me, sucking me dry within the maze of its internal organs. Today, I spoke to you from within that mouth of Goliath, slipped you a note between the slivers of gigantic teeth. Using Goliath's voice to replace my own unconvincing one, I tell you this story, and I hope you heard. Thank you.